I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking all about burnout. I know when I was on the fertility journey, I literally said I was not stressed. And I know looking back, that was simply not the case. I had chronic stress for years. I just had a lot of energy and I kept going. So if you are feeling overwhelmed, you're feeling frustrated, you maybe actually are identifying as being burnt out, which is completely normal dealing with the fertility journey, then today's episode is for you. Excited for you to listen. Let's go. Hey, Dr. Rika, excited to have you back on the podcast. I'm so excited to be here, Sarah. I know we were just chatting beforehand. It's like, oh my goodness, you're last on here back in 2018. Where has the time gone? <laughs> I know, really, maybe a pandemic got in the way or something like that. But um, yeah, I was just reflecting on that. And ironically, as we had spoken earlier, someone found me from that original podcast just today, which was from four years ago. Yeah. And um, you know, as far as, you know, you know, when you do speaking and if um, I do a variety of things, I said, wow, that's so the irony of that, the day that I talked to someone who found me from your last one that you and I are chatting again. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. It's so funny. So definitely check out that episode we did with uh, Dr. Rika that was all on MTHFR. So we went down into the weeds on that, but actually it was like super actionable and an awesome episode. Definitely check it out. So today we're talking all about burnout. And this is something we see a lot. And this was actually, I experienced this when I was on the fertility journey. So I was diagnosed with premature ovarian insufficiency at 28, as everyone knows. And um, I remember at one point, and I'm like, get it done, like keep going kind of person. I remember at one point though, my mailbox was across the street and I was like, wow, I can't even think of going across the street to get the mail. Like it was just like one more thing on a list of crap I had to do. Um, to go and get the mail. And then I was like, oh, like that, looking back, that's burnout. And actually, um, I'm going to have you define it, but but uh, define burnout. But it's interesting. I read a book um, on burnout by um, Emily, what's her name? Em- Emily uh, Nagoski. Uh, Nag- Nag- Nagoski? And um, that, yeah, the secrets, uh, burnout, the secrets to unlocking the stress cycle. And she said when she, they were researching the book Burnout, and she, they asked women, what's burnout? No one said, I don't know what that is. Everyone's like, yeah, I've had that at some point in my life. Yeah. So what, so what's your take on burnout? Yeah. So there's a variety of, like you said, definitions and, you know, there's a physical burnout from, you know, literally burning the candle on both ends and not getting enough sleep. And then it leads to that, emo- the mental and emotional burnout. So there's that two, two levels of burnout it, or it could be a combo. And it's like, which one came first? And, you know, usually manifests as that either you're not doing things with that same jump in your step. So that might be some of the first things So think about runners, I ran a marathon and they'll say, you know, when you're overtraining. And so that's a form of burnout too, that you'll not want to get out and run. And that happened a few times. So that means you got to back off and same with life. So hopefully people are paying attention to these cues, but what I would caution before we continue on with the conversation, what it is, is that most people don't even, they say, I don't feel stressed and it manifests in different ways. So this level of burnout could be Uh, One executive I treated just had GI symptoms that would always manifest. And so what she would do is she'd get to the end of an 18 month long project and just utterly crash. And so it can be everything from symptoms that have nothing to do with even realizing that you're burnt out to that mild fatigue, to not wanting to do things with that same like bounce in your stuff to maybe even a mild depression to the flat out burnout is when you can't get off the couch. So that's, that's long gone. And one thing I heard just the other day, or I saw someone post and we're as high performing professional women, both you and I, and a lot of people that we affiliate with, I, I was reading a post the other day and they're like, I didn't feel like working out. And then I worked out and then I went to a yoga class and then, and then, and then, and I'm like, why would you push yourself? Why not just say, I don't really feel well. And I will, I'm going to do a modest amount of extra activity instead of three activities in a row like that. That's just kind of ramping it up. I mean, certainly there are times in life. And I, I heard recently someone say, it's not a matter of balance. It's a matter of being blended, Right. And I, but the other way I describe it is it's going to go in peaks and valleys. So unless you are in some unique situation where something really has to be done and you're having to stay up to really accomplish something, that should be the exception and not the norm, right? Yeah, that was it. Was interesting. But that was for me. Like for years, I I literally didn't think I was stressed, and all these things were going on. Like I'm not stressed because I had a lot of energy, kept going. But then I'd be 
having the worst anger management issues in traffic. I'd be like, oh my God, like road rage. Like you wouldn't, I was like driving like an absolute maniac, like flying down the highway. Um, or I'd be like just super irritable or so things were out of alignment. So now when I see myself, I got mm-hmm. to the point where I'm like, why can't I pee faster? Like peeing was taking too much time out of my day. I'm like, I got to go faster. And it was, it was ridiculous. And so now I'm like, and every, I remember every September, I'd be like, September would come along. This is before I had kids, but September would come along. I'm like, oh, I got to do this, 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 and I'd like sign up for all these different things. And then every October, I'd be like, why did I just sign up for five different programs in either education, physical fitness, whatever it was. And I kept doing it to myself over and over again, like for years to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. And so it's like to be able to, like you said, it's not about just going, going, going. How do you, how do you recognize, like listen to your own body? Mm-hmm. So, um, so as you say, so some of the themes, themes you're seeing, so like sort of that, that digestive issues, like what, what are you looking at there? Um, you know, where they'll either get, they get the IBS symptoms, so diarrhea alternating with constipation more often, or just diarrhea and alone, not as frequently as constipation. Usually they're running to the bathroom and to chime in what you said, you didn't even realize it. So before, you know, when I had fertility, I didn't know about functional medicine and it was the same. I had some of the same things. Um, I met someone who then I hadn't seen for years and said, boy, you're no longer angry. And I was like, what? I wasn't (laughs) angry. Like, what are you talking about? But this is someone who knew me pretty intimately. It was in a closed social circle. And I was just like dumbfounded. Like, so that's goes to show you, I was, had some of these same things. And um, yeah, so you're, the themes I typically see is, uh, you know, and this is, and I will segue into why I went to some of the other arenas that I participate in is, you know, they're high performing all their life. They push, 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 driven, driven, driven. And then sometimes they literally drop. I had an entrepreneur come in the other day that said that she laid down um, on the stage at the gym she owned and she she pretty much fell asleep for hours. And then she couldn't even get up and her staff had to kind of pick her up, walk her to her car. And she went home and slept for like another day. And I'm like, wow, that's like serious stuff. So you get everything from that to the subtle, you're not even realizing what you're doing. And sadly, if someone's not given the right tools and first is the acknowledgement that I need to have self-care, I need to explore uh, probably a bigger issues. I need to explore what drives me to the point of where it would make, make me sick. And if that's not explored, that's how, so if they don't acknowledge it's maybe happening, they don't acknowledge. So, you know, there's all that underlying trauma. Was it because someone in their life felt they weren't good enough? So they're striving to overcome that living belief. So there's just one of many examples. And uh, that's kind of an intricate dance that we'll do. And sometimes it comes out with my health coach, or maybe even I'll recommend the, you know, that they see a therapist to determine because otherwise, and they'll keep going. Well, if there's no driving issue like that, and that's just the way they're wired, then it's really talking to them about the, the other thing I see is they'll come in, I'll recover them. They'll be good for a year. They won't change the patterns, even though they've been instructed and they'll come back right in the same situation. And that kind of led to another aspect of some of the work that I do, because I'm like, I'm going to prevent these guys from coming back. (laughs) Yeah. It's interesting. Like that cycle, right? it's like you, we all, we all slip up at how long you stay down there for It's Like, is it like months, years and for the rest of your life, you don't even recognize it anymore. And Mm -hmm. so, and yeah, and people I've obviously on the fertility journey, they're like throwing everything at this problem, like doing doing all the things and many people that we're working with, like professional women um, that are also like working like 50 plus hours a week. So a lot of, and they may have be staying at the job way longer than they wanted to because maybe they, you know, they wanted to be pregnant and so they don't want to look for another job. So they're in this kind of this vicious cycle. So how do you balance like when you've got someone with that busy job and then they're trying to take care of their health? What, when you, what are you seeing there? Oh gosh, I love that you asked this. So one of the reasons why I said, so all my life, I would say I've identified as a high performer, but then, you know, came across my desk like, Hey, you know, maybe get trained as a high performance coach. And I saw it in action and I saw the results people were getting. And it was really my tip off. I was like, how do I teach them to be high performing? And, um, so I trained under Brendan Burchard and he says, you want to be able to have, um, results that are above the norm, um, consistently over time without compromising your life. And so they've run studies on these traits of the high performers that the, the kind of the things that they do that, um, 
don't allow them or that don't get them to that burnout phase. And they ironically found that you can coach people around these traits. And, you know, one is clarity. So having crystal clear clarity over what defines you. And so, and maybe your audience and viewers either now as we're speaking or at the end of the podcast, write down what are three words that define you and how you want people to know you for. So for me, it's, I always want to, I want to inspire I want to empower and radiant, radiantly me. And so one of the things I'm launching is radiantly she. And so it's, those are my words. And so I live by that. And then, you know, we take them through that journey. So it's learning how to have courage. It's learning how to assess uh, things and opportunities that come your way that are a good fit with in an alignment with your, the clarity that you have for yourself and how you want to show up in the world. And so those are just some strategies. And I always say, like you said, you want to be saying, so in that high, we have a high performance indicator. It tells you whether you should be taking on that next job or that next project. And I say more often than times you should say no, you know, or you should make sure that whatever that offer or that time is that it doesn't cost you opportunity wise. So let me give you a good example. So I had a few launches I was going to do. And then my son had a major hiccup. Thankfully he wasn't seriously ill. And we have now a year and a half later have resolved all his issues. But if I would have launched these things, I could not have given him the time he deserved. And I, and if I had say I launched and I tried to tend to him, I would have burned out. So I wasn't going to do anyone any good. And so that's the opportunity cost. The the cost to me would have been so great because I might not have gotten him well, or I could have taken myself out physically or maybe even say ruined a relationship when you get so cranky and you can't, you know, you're not as nice as you normally are or whatever. And you're re you're reactive instead of proactive. So, so, so many steps. And, um, if you're, if you're willing to have me share, I'd love to share a situation that came up just in, in April. Yeah. And I think, cause it's a poignant time and I'm going to outline some steps I took and I, I welcome anyone to do it. And it does relate back to my fertility journey. So April without getting into details was after five or six months of just some extraordinary bad life events, thank death, many family members, sick, uh, lots of hiccups in the road. And I know as entrepreneurs, we pivot and that's how we learn, but it was time and time again. And I really felt like every day, that was one of the times that I actually felt internally stressed from the morning I woke up till when I went to bed. And that's not, and that's with me meditating and me using heart math and me eating well, and me gently exercising with them. So I'm, I'm still feeling this way. And I reverted back to what my acupuncture said when I was on my fertility journey. And it was before I knew functional medicine. And she said, you know what you, you know, I told her I didn't like living the first time we moved here in downtown Chicago and it was busy and crowded. And I just said, it's just so difficult. Like to go to target, it's four miles away and it takes 45 minutes because it's the only one in the city and it's so crowded. She's like, maybe your challenge is to find a way to live stress-free despite the stress. And I, you know, then I was like, who is she? What is she? You know, like I did follow her thing. She had some other great methods. And I, I joke, and we had, um, along with acupuncture, did some visualizations of having me see myself pregnant. Right. And so that's the law of attraction. And I started dreaming I was pregnant. And then when we got pregnant, I'm like, oh, she, she made this baby happy. So I think it was a multi faceted approach though. And so I said to myself, you know what? the situation is not going to change. Like all these bad things that are happening, I can't change that my mom is very sick and that she may not be able to care for. I can't change that. And that a lot is being put upon all of us within the family to try to support her. I can't change that. So I'm going to do what she says. I consciously made that decision to live stress-free despite the stress. And it was like just the tipping point of what led to some of the other steps. So I'm going to pause now so then you can interject as well if you have anything to add. Yeah, I I love that. Even like when someone will just say, well, you can breathe. And then I'm like, oh, I've been walking all around all day with my shoulders up. Like Even as you said that, you get stress-free. You're like, oh, I can, the shoulders can come down. I can breathe. And I don't need to be like, (laughs) like that, right? To be more conscious about it. And I think like the, the first step is awareness. And sometimes we don't know. We're an automatic pilot for years. Yeah. And, and then the second step that I personally took was that um, I had heard someone speak and it was the gentleman who authored the last law of attraction book 
you'll ever need. And I firmly believe in visualization and the law of attraction. And he had me thinking, and I just instead, and then I had actually uh, listened to another book um, called The Gap in the Gain. And yeah. The Gap in the Gain describes the gentleman who was an ice or a speed skater and he had never won the Olympics. And then it was his last Olympics and going into the, he'd, law, he'd not meddled in any of the events. He's on his last event and he decided to reflect on his life and everything he was grateful for. And he went on to win a medal, the only medal that he had. And I forget the guy's name. And so I thought about that. I'm like, I'm just going to go back to what I know and have just gratitude. It's so easy for us today with social media and everything and everyone posting and their life looks perfect on social media. But when in reality, the background looks like this, there's books, it might be messy. It's not this uh, pristine beach. <laughs> it's our virtual background. And so I said, you know, I'm just going to be grateful. That's how you grow infinitely richer is just be grateful for what you have. I have just those two things, my energy soared. And then that release that just that release of, I didn't wake up so stressed. And then I really started visualizing and using the tactics that um, Andrew Cap had outlined in his book, the last law of attraction book you'll ever need on seeing my life like the way I want it. I know exactly what I'd love to have in my life. And I was just happier. So I'd wake up and it was just like, wow, the grass was greener. And I could smell like the blooms and, you know, all these things we have to be grateful for, but we live, we live in that gap. We're told we're not good enough or we don't have the right things or we didn't take the best selfie. And I'll have to laugh. I probably took, when social media first came out, I probably had the worst selfies online. It was the worst selfie taker ever. So uh, there there you have it. So that's my strategy is make the decision, live in gratitude, visualize your life. Uh, like you want. This is on top of all those foundational things that you and I teach to our patients with the breath work. And um, I'll tell you, you know, sleep intermittently, especially as all those of us who are approaching menopause and go into menopause can be an issue. But I found that if I wake up in the middle of the night, I just implement my breathing and I've been doing energy chakra meditations and I'll go back to sleep. And so it's deconditioning yourself from that habit of getting up of and being up for hours. And it's been nothing shy of amazing. Yeah, it is interesting as you just really intentionally go delve into some of these things. I'm like deep in this in a whole manifesting journey right now where I'm like, and like unblocking old things I didn't even know was there to like then really manifest. It's interesting how then you start thinking like intentionally these things start showing up because a lot of us are like, Oh, she's got it or he's got it or they have it. Meanwhile, we can like all the signs are around us for for you know for us. We may just not be noticing the signs. And so mm-hmm. to be able to cultivate that and then really, I guess, get your nervous system out of that like fight or flight. Because if you're still up here like getting pissed off about something, you know, in that fight or flight, how do you bring everything down? Um, yeah. So what so what would so the same similar tips there, the clarity, the gratitude the visualization of someone's just like, Oh my goodness, I am like up to my freaking eyeballs in it. Yeah. Two forms of breathe. Well, for the acute, like insult, like say you're so mad, you're seeing red, something happened and you're just so angry or really stressed for the acute stressors. Then I really, really do like either box breathing or four, seven, eight breathing where they, they, so you inhale for four, hold for seven, exhale for eight, where the expiration is longer than the the inhalation. And so if you do that, I was listening to another practitioner who shares my same views. And I I think you do too, Sarah. Um, She has a sensitivity to histamine and she went into a full-blown allergic reaction sitting outside of the ER. I didn't want to go in and she just box bread, um, breathed until even that. So that's the power of the mind over the body is like, certainly, of course, there's not things we can control, but you can you know, control, uh, the trigger of all the stress hormones and bring it down a notch very quickly. You just need to start utilizing. And then over time, the reason why I like using biofeedback, um, is it makes you more resilient. And, um, um, some of my chronically ill patients, I refer to do, um, retraining of the limbic system. And one woman was doing one of these, the two particular pro- programs I advise on. And it's some of the same thing, the affirmations, the meditations, it's changing the dialogue. And she said, you know, um, we, I was having all these things come up and I found myself responding a little less reactive to everything after doing 
implementing some of these tools that I was taught on how to, you know, reframe and, and be very careful about what you say with your words. I always tell people, I'm like, your words are your, you know, change your words, change your life. So if you're one of these people, you know, in the fertility journey, it's, it's sad. I've, I've been there. You've been there is, is, you know, I'm never going to get pregnant. I mean, it's really easy to think that, but just seeing yourself like that acupuncturist, she said, I want you to start visualizing what you look at, like at four months pregnant at nine months pregnant. I want you to visualize holding that baby. And that's when I started to dream it. And it really felt so attainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes just playing the seed for someone. And then it's like, oh, okay. You know, I can do that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so some of the diet recommendations of like for burnout, do you have like sort of, obviously we look at an anti-inflammatory diet and things like that, but what, like, what are you looking at as sort of some go-tos for someone? Yeah. You know, I, I like that anti-inflammatory. So you do want to avoid the top inflammatory foods and gluten, dairy, sugar, soy for some people is eggs, corn, and some people it's nuts. And even citrus can, I've had people react to citrus um, things. You either, um, so you have them eating whole foods that are not within that category. I just rattled off. And I really like a more, so if you go really low calorie or very low carb, you can induce and trigger burnout even further. So I tell people you really need to be, eating, you know, pro- if you had to pick a one size fits all, I'd probably say the Mediterranean diet and perhaps even paleo Mediterranean, but that is almost a one size fits all. We can have a whole nother, uh, like a podcast interview over a diet. Cause I have a very precise strategy and it depends on what the goal for the person is in mind. Is it, um, cleaning up symptoms? Is it weight loss? Um, is it brain health? And so there's different diets I would utilize. And I do utilize genetics for that as well. So there's a, I've engineered it where you don't need the genetics. And so we teach people how to eat according to their body. And then I have utilized the genetics. So it makes it so powerful to go back and forth. But I'd say word of caution for not eating enough calories or eating too low of carbs. It's just going to continue to pull down your adrenal glands. Yeah, we we have the genetics as well. And it's also like really powerful for the behavioral side of things where people are like, oh, okay, that's for me. That's why, that's why that makes sense. Cause sometimes we're, you know, having these these changes and maybe there's not buy-in. Is that what you're finding too with it? Um, yes, yes, it does help with buy-in. So if you give them and you know, you tell people, even though the genes can predispose you or things may not work with our lifestyle, what we do. So eating that diet that doesn't trigger adrenals, using the breath work that gets us out of fight or flight, doing that can modify, you know, the stress response. And there is, you know, you can look at the way you break down your stress hormones and some people don't clear them fast enough. And ironically, those are the ones who have a longer negative memory associated with that event and um, can predict, you know, whether someone who has a traumatic event has PTSD or not. And so I often thought maybe we need to be screening anyone who's in the line of fire, meaning our military, maybe the police, possibly paramedics, because when they're exposed to that, they're going to be at higher risk, either that or doing a strong educational program around it, you know, and then counseling them and say, hey, you're at higher risk. Here are strategies you need to do every day. Yeah, that's really Yeah. That's really interesting too. Cause some people, yeah, they just hang on to it. They can't let it go. Or I'm like, okay, I've totally moved on. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, So that there's a genetic predisposition, but again, I think we can at the moment, you know, the, all the data shows that you can override the genes with a nice, good, healthy lifestyle. Now ask me in 10 years, if the planet keeps getting more and more toxic, I'm going to say, probably you better know your genes so you can support them. But at the moment you can probably override most of that with good diet lifestyle. And so lifestyle strategies, I know you like heart math. We talked about it before. I've been trying to get a representative from heart math on the, on my podcast for ages, but I cannot seem to to make that happen, but hopefully one day I'll get that going. But, um, and yeah, I've used the heart math monitor for years as well, although I accidentally stepped on it a while ago, so I have to get a new one, but, um, how do you, um, heart math or other lifestyle strategies that you employ? Yeah. So I have them heart math. Ideally, I'd love to have them do, you know, one to two times a day. Uh, We look at 
uh, exercise and make sure they're not over exercising. So the driven people tend to over exercise. And I know it's super, super popular in, in, to, you know, go to some of these burn, uh, boot camps or boot camps. And then CrossFit, I think is probably not the healthiest. And, um, there are ways you can assess is the training. Are you recovering from your training? So the Garmin watch is one method, even the aura ring to see if your heart rate variability. So, um, so we look at, you know, implementing a strategy. So they're out of fight or flight, at least part of the day, and then making sure their lifestyle is not driving that. So diet we talked about for exercise, it's typically over exercise or it's, um, they're over utilizing cardio. So they're going long bouts of cardio and they're not doing any strength training and that'll deplete you as well. Um, other lifestyle things, probably my top, top two. And I say, you know what you can, um, to really be more productive is you need to schedule that time off. And I've proven this time and time again. So quarterly, I have a week where, um, part of the week I go and just be, so I'm doing fun things. And then part of the week, when I come back, I'm creating things uh, for my businesses, for my practice, um, you know, implementing, creating new ways to support people better within the practice. And I, you know, I, I just get so much more done. You, you just get that refresh. So, and it could be a simple, you know, grounding. So going outside and just putting your feet on the, you know, the grass for 10 minutes, first thing in the morning, when you're getting that morning light in your eyes and, um, out in nature. So we will periodically, um, you know, spend the whole morning hiking with the dog and I can come back and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I just feel rejuvenated. So nature grounding, limiting, and being careful on the amount and type of exercise, making sure it's not too much, not too little. And that, the that the calories and the carbs are not too low. Yeah. I also find the screen time. like, for me personally, if I, if I have, I, I've got to take a, like I'm on the weekend, I, I try to have at least one day to take a break, but it, it's cause it's become so like literally now, cause I'm posting my, I'm, I'm challenging myself to post daily on Instagram and post daily on TikTok. Now I'm like, Oh, I'm looking at it more than I want. So I'm trying to batch post them, but it's, um, because it, it, it makes me feel a little crazy after a while. Cause I'm like searching for it. I'm looking, Oh, who liked it? Well, all that kind of stuff. And then it's like a dopamine hit. And then, um, it's, just, I feel it very unhealthy for me. And so for me to step away from that, I'm like, okay, I gotta go read. And typically I'll read outside as long as it's warm. But um, yeah, like that kind of piece, right? So a lot of us with this phone and we're scrolling and looking at nothing, like nothing. Yes. And when I, so my husband's so good at this, like he could write the book on how to live well. He, he, he could write the simple lifestyle to, to a long and healthy life because he really lives by that. Like he comes home and he puts his phone in the drawer and I don't know how he gets his iPhone to have a long life battery. It never, probably because he's never on it. <laughs> and he, my husband. Same. he doesn't have social media and he's only on nope. LinkedIn for business that's, purposes. That's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> He's hardly on that either. And so what I've started to implement and after that very stressful time where I turned it around, like it was literally a few weeks where I'm like, I can't change this. So I don't over schedule. I have scheduled downtime. I have scheduled self-care for me. I mean, that could be as simple as like last night. It'd been ages since I went out to dinner with one of my local friends. You know, we've had a lot of company this summer, but so let's reconnect. And you know, both of our phones were in our purses the whole time. Nobody was, so put the phone away. And so one thing like after we get done here is um, I'm going to plug my phone in downstairs and not attend to it. And the kids are so, so if you've got, I mean, you're talking about a fertility thing, but everyone around you is impacted. So the people you're not paying attention to, whether it's you have kids and one second kid, whether it's, you don't have kids and it's your spouse, or maybe it's your best friend, they notice that. And so a, a super powerful thing someone had done with me was I'd met, um, a gentleman who wrote the clarity cleanse. We were both okay. speaking for Jenny McCarthy. I'm blanking on his name right now. And he, when we spoke, he looked right into my eyes and was still and just listened. And it was like, I felt so important. So now I try to honor that um, back. To, I mean, like we've lost this art of just even in the pandemic kind of squash, you know, one of the things is, you know, my parents are European and in Europe, you could pretty much pop into anyone's home and no one's, there's no like set time to come over. You can go, certainly there are times where they have parties or gatherings, 
But here in the U.S., it just seems like it's a little bit more formal for the most part, not always. And we used to host, we lived abroad for a number of years. We used to host dinner parties. And we, it was funny. Then abroad, I think a lot of people did. We moved back to the U.S. and we were the only ones hosting like over and over and over again. I'm like, we did it because we liked it. So we weren't expecting anything. But yeah, reconnect with people. So yeah, that, that connection piece, I, I believe we all want to connect, right? And it's interesting as we're, yeah, we're out and about, or maybe we're just connecting over Zoom, but it's connecting in person. I, I still think the Zoom connection can be good. I've never met you. I've known you for years. We're, we're connected more in the last year. We're in the same same groups. Um, but it's like, yeah, you feel like you know the person. So yeah, it's like, in, you know, there's there's Zoom and then also, but you know, the, the in-person thing where is, is there is something about being in person with someone and then to not have your phone. And, you know, I think it's a generational too. It's like my, my daughter's 20. I think for her not to look at her phone when she's with her friends, I don't even think that would happen. They're all communicating with the phone and all that stuff around them. So maybe it's a generational piece there, but it's still, you know, she, she puts it away. My son, not, you know, not so much, but um, yeah, it is, it is to see what feels right for you. But I think to even, if we were to say to someone, Oh, let's challenge you to take the phone out the bedroom or to not look at it for a day. What, you know, what would you do? Would you melt down or would you be like, Oh, okay. I can totally do that. I think by your response, what you told me about is such a challenge to like, ah, you you feel like tied because we, we're both passionate about educating and a lot of education comes across on social media. Yeah. And, um, I would be fine. I think you would be fine too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would be fine. Especially if I put it away and then wouldn't look at it. So if it's a way that I won't look at it. if it's in my hands, you're right. It's that dopamine hit. And why, why not just sit and be, and, um, you know, I had a good girlfriend that, you know, as well, come into town and yeah. we were slated to teach at a conference. So then we decided to keep the visit. And initially it was supposed to be a workcation, like work on the business and then take time for ourselves. And we literally had, I think, one morning that was fabulous where we shared best practices from everything from clinical to business to at life, you know, just like how we stayed healthy. And we caught up on that. And initially I was kind of like, oh my God, I'm so stressed. We didn't get to do all these things we're supposed to do for our business. And then later I'm like, you know what? I am so glad we just didn't keep churning. And we sat and we had afternoon pate on my patio for like, a couple hours and that, you know, and then when we would sit outside and have dinner at night, and so this is a perfect time to do that. There was no end point. We could just sit there for several hours and yeah. So it was the the best. So yeah, thinking about structuring or scheduling in one day a month, one week, a quarter, whatever it takes for you to refuel. And I'll tell you, uh, especially anyone who's in the service industry or like us, who is, um, uh, dealing with clients where you're, it's an energy exchange or expenditure is, and I noticed this in regular practice, what I would do is then I only took a day, but I get to that saturation point after three months of seeing people and I would take one full day off. And it was that then I was younger. It was definitely enough. Um, and it's not like physically I'm drained. It's more of, I just need to refuel and, and then regain my creativity. So never, uh, never a physical anymore. Cause I've kind of mastered that after three decades of fatigue. So we're good there. With energy. We're keeping it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes people think it's like these tactical things, but sometimes it's the not it's, you know, cause I was like, Oh, what did I do? I mean, the, the plan, the list, the, you know, to do list. Uh, uh, most of the time it's just what you're, what not to like, like you're saying, just spending time with your friend is actually more restorative than like burning, churning through 50 hours of checking off a list. And then you come out of that and go, wait, I don't need to have things as complicated or we don't need to do all these things that we feel we need to do. And we can actually just say either we're going to delegate it or maybe it's not even, even important that we're, that we're doing it. Why is it even on the list? Yeah. And one book. So I love giving resources because you never know what clicks what, and I think you found this with clients. You can tell the same two people, the exact same set of instruction and one will execute and the other one needs it set in a different way or needs to maybe even hear it a few times. And so um, there's been so many books written about how do we simplify this? And I really love the book Essentialism. Yeah. And it has you pick just three. You're only focused on three things. And how many of us and those are the three arenas. And they have a whole process in the book. I, I always read a lot of books after the new year. 
And then I actually have a strategy for this year that I'll tell you about that in a moment. And, um, and then I actually went through and spent two or three hours and got very crystal clear and maybe I need to revisit it. I've, it's probably behind me here somewhere. And I, um, and like marked it up and everything. So, um, yeah, I, I love to read. I felt like I was having so many books that didn't get read through. So my son and I are taking the super reading class by Jim oh, quick. I heard that. Yeah. It's amazing. And so what I'm going to challenge everyone is like you and I both hear, Oh, how do you guys defy the odds with your tactics? I'm like, we have to be open to the possibility that we can actually change how our bodies function, that we can actually conceive, you know, you and I both have reversed things that people will say is not reversible. And uh, same with speed reading. He says, everything we're taught about reading as a child, uh, you know, is wrong. And they tell you not to use your finger. And that's one of his tactics. And so I'm only five days in, I've gone from 300 words a minute to 413. Oh, wow. Five days. And he gives you one tip. So just be open. Like, I mean, I'm open to the possibility, but like, if you had just heard that flippantly, you'd be like, no way, I'm not going to be able to increase. You have to be open to that possibility. And there's so many um, strategies and techniques. So for me, it was done because there's a couple of areas of study that I'm going into and I'm picking one at a time, mind you one instead of 10 or whatever. And I, my ears have more time than my eyes, but my eyes learn quicker actually. So I'm a visual learner. And so I thought, well, how do I, and my son and I were talking about let's maximize your strength, your, your strengths or let's and strengthen your weaknesses. And he said, you know, the reading could be um, faster for me. You know, he's an average reader. He's not a slow reader, but it's his perception. And so he's also increased well over a hundred words. It's like an amazing thing. So you yeah, just be open to the possibility, right? That, you know, I, I had to find a guide. I didn't know how to do it. So I had a guide. I didn't try to read faster. And he not only teaches speed reading, but comprehension. So he teaches you how to comprehend it. So you're not just reading words that don't mean anything to you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can spin through a page and you're like, okay, can you, can you say exactly what it is you just saw? No, maybe not. Um, okay. So I'll, my next question was more about uh, books, apps, and documentary, anything that you're obsessed with. Now you've, you've listed a lot of books, anything, anything you wanted to that you're currently obsessed with sounds like the reading piece perhaps but. Yeah, the, the reading um so yeah we we went through the books and just to refresh for everyone i like the gap in the gain it really um and i actually taught my son the strategy going into a tennis tournament and it, he let go of he had a little block he'd never he rarely gets this but in the prior tournament to the second to last tournament he let his emotions get the best of him. And then, so I just primed him. So I like that. I like essentialism. Um, what else? Oh, in the, the last fall of attraction book, um, app wise, obviously the heart math app that goes with the sensor. Um, I really like, and I guide people to use uh, chronometer, okay. um, which is a free it's app and website in it to track things. So I have this, um, you asked about diets. So I'll just allude to it here. Um, it's the task method, T A S K to an abundant diet. So I call it the abundant diet. And I think some of the ways we get into trouble is that they're too restrictive for too long. And you've seen this come through the door. So the pendulum swings, we tell people to get off all these things, but the elimination diet is supposed to be short term. And then you're supposed to reintroduce and you can really shoot a lot of things in the foot. So I have them track a variety of parameters to see if they're eating in an abundant way that, so it's T for track. We give them about eight parameters. Uh, A is for add. So we're going to add in whatever they're missing. And only then do we have them subtract. Um, and take away. And, and typically say it's someone who's never eaten healthy, then they're primed. They're so full on all the good stuff that it's pretty simple to eliminate. And the K is for keep. So track, add, subtract, keep. So it's a simple method. And I like the little acronym so people can easily remember what we're trying to instruct them to do. I love it. I love it. And um, you've got a free um, download here for the um, the listeners. And I'll have that linked in the show notes, but it's, so it's 10 days to infinite energy, you have an ebook. Um, what can they expect in that? Yeah, so it goes through. Um, that was really written. So here's a little a little tip. It was really written around um, kind of the process and some of the things I talk about in the office. So say someone couldn't see me or they didn't want to consult or uh, whatever, they just want to get a little piece of that information. So it's just a way for them to see this is some of the things I advise on, and I probably need to update it because. Um, 
but it's still solid. I mean, it was based on some of the teachings I do with my one-on-one clients. So, and that's absolutely free, um, is that, um, I will update it cause I've updated some of the methodology, but it's still pretty sound. And, um, it gives you 10 different strategies and things to focus on. So one thing per day. Awesome. And any final thoughts on our topic here on burnout? Yeah. Um, you know, getting back to when you said, oh, I didn't even realize I was burnt out. The common denominators were creating an environment when I got pregnant naturally. So we had three failed IUIs for the before the first natural pregnancy and three, two failed IVFs. And was that stress modification piece and my workload the first time I had transferred practices and was only seeing two patients or three patients a day as opposed to 25 to 35. And so I didn't even acknowledge in my mind that that, that I was actually so stressed, just, just to reiterate what you said in the beginning. And, um, so I think that's crucial. Um, and then to be kind and give yourself grace and think about, as you're listening to this podcast, what is the one thing that stands out that we've spoken about that maybe you're not doing? Maybe are you not in nature? Do you not get outside every day? Do you schedule any downtime for yourself? And I get it. We're all busy, but um, I don't know of any job that works you 24, seven, seven days a week. So people certainly work 24 hours in a shift or 36, uh, your medics and your docs and things like that, but not all every day. You just, it's not even sustainable. So you schedule that time. And then when, if you get to, so if things are not working, then seek a guide. So I want to learn how to read faster. I could have looked on the internet forever in a day and maybe pulled together a few YouTube videos to teach me, but I have a very precise process and I increase my reading speed in like two or three days, the, the first, the initial hundred words. So yeah, find that guy that's super crucial. It always shortcuts to you know where you need to go, especially if you're not getting the results or you're not certain what's holding you up or keeping you stuck. I agree. Fast tracks your success. That's why we all, yeah. once you have a coach, you always have a coach because you need to it fast track what, you know, what we're doing today. So yeah. yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rika. And um, all the best. Yeah, it was great to be on your show.